Good morning and welcome to St Michael's Church, New Haven, this third Sunday of Lent. Let us be quiet for a moment as we remember God's presence with us wherever we are as we share in this service. Let us pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are not far away, but very close to us now. Thank you for the timeless gift of your Son, Jesus. Guide us by your Holy Spirit in our response to him during this time of Lent. Thank you for your message of love and hope and salvation in him. Draw us close to you and to one another in these weeks before Easter. We ask it in his name. Amen. And now I invite you to join in <clears throat> with the first hymn that's on the YouTube page. During this time of Lent, it's our tradition to go through the Ten Commandments each week and at the end of each, please say, Amen, Lord, have mercy. <clears throat> Hear the commandments which God has given to his people and examine your hearts. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods but me. Amen, Lord, have mercy. You shall not make for yourself any idol. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not dishonour the name of the Lord your God. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Honour your father and your mother. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit murder. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit adultery. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not steal. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbour. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us and write all these, your laws, in our hearts. And so let us go on to our confession. Let's take a moment to bring to mind any particular things of which we're ashamed or regret that we need to confess today. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. So let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, to our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you and upon me. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness. and Keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Collect for the Third Sunday of Lent. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified, Mercifully grant that we, 
walking in the way of the cross, they find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're now going to hear the reading for today. John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at table exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume you. The Jew then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken forty-six years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Sermon for Sunday, the 7th of March, 2021. This is the third Sunday of Lent. This sermon for St. Michael's New Haven is based on the reading from John, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. Father, help us as we look into this visit by Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem to begin to grasp what he was representing there, what you were getting across there concerning him and help us to be become more firm, assured, rested in our relationship with you through him, for his name's sake. Amen. When Hilary and I lived in downtown Tunis, just outside the Medina, a poor area of the capital, we enjoyed the sight of various ceremonies that happened when people got married. So groups of women would sing their way to the nearby hammam or public baths for the bathing of the bride in the week before marriage. Or the bridegroom with best man and others would ride in a horse and carriage to collect a bride and bring her to her new husband's home. In the world of Jesus, the marital norm was for the bridegroom to remain as part of his parents' household. A solemn, solemn moment in a wedding was when the bride was brought into the home of her new bridegroom. A lovely subplot in the early chapters of John's Gospel revolves around the presentation there of John the Baptist as the friend of the bridegroom. Chapter 3, verse 29. We looked a few weeks ago at the wedding in Cana of Galilee and asked the question, who is the real bridegroom in the room? Is it the unnamed, unnoticed, ineffectual human host of the proceedings? Or is it Jesus? John Baptist's words in the following chapter make the answer very clear. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not Christ, but am sent ahead of him. 
The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. John is a friend, is the friend of the bridegroom. Jesus is the real bridegroom. From Capernaum, Jesus and his new disciples travel to Jerusalem and enter the temple. But what does Jesus call the temple? He refers to it as my father's house in verse 16. This is the next movement in a marriage story. The bridegroom brings his bride into his father's house. And it is in the Father's house that Jesus explicitly reveals his identity. He is his Father's Son. Incidentally, the following chapter of John's Gospel will deal with what? Well, the birth of children to the new family. But children born from above. This is... A lovely subplot, isn't it? In Cana at the wedding, the question left hanging in the air had been, who is the real bridegroom? In Jerusalem, at the centre of the Jewish sacrificial cultus, the question left hanging in the air is, what, or rather, who, is the real temple? John writes up his account of the cleansing of the temple with this question in mind. He places the cleansing at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry and focuses in it on the issue of authority. Who might have authority within the temple grounds to dictate temple practice, to disrupt it, to negate or override it? What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? The Jewish leaders demanded, verse 18. I guess the priests bustling around the temple during a busy festival quickly gave up hope of seeing some authorization from the chief priest's office, allowing Jesus to drive out animals, scatter money, overturn tables, evict dove sellers. In the absence of such human authorization, they demand a sign from heaven, some miraculous sign that Jesus is doing what God is giving him authority to do. Authority? asks Jesus. That's easy. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Verse 19. The Jews in the temple think that the real temple is the building standing around them, the solid stone, beautiful construction that took 46 years to build and was still not finished. Verse 20. What's all this rubbish about knocking it down and rebuilding it in three days? John, the gospel writer, tells us what the Jews in the temple had no idea of. Verse 21. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. In fact, at the time, no one could grasp what Jesus was talking about. It was only after Jesus had been raised from the dead that the penny dropped, for the disciples at least, as they recalled what Jesus had said, verse 22. Oh, Jesus is the real temple. The real temple is the body of Jesus. At the time, something did connect with Jesus' disciples. They responded to Jesus' actions and words about the turning of his father's house into a market. Verse 16. Wow, they say, we get this bit. It's just like that scripture coming alive before our eyes. Zeal for your house will consume me. Verse 17, where they're quoting Psalm 69, verse 9. Zeal for your house is shorthand for what does God think about what is going on in this temple? The disciples' choice of this Old Testament scripture 
is amazing, isn't it? Because consume means that Jesus expends all his energy in trying to do his best on behalf of his father's interests. But consume, the word, also carries overtones of what that representing will ultimately entail. It will literally consume him. This is no arrogant, dismissive display of anger. This is zeal for something ultimate that will ultimately cost Jesus his life to see through. What Jesus in his self-sacrificing zeal is doing here is reclaiming his father's house for his father. More than that, Jesus is not coming to the temple as a pilgrim, but as a bridegroom. He is bringing his bride to his father's house. He arrives with his new disciples. At the same time, his provocative action makes us all wonder, where is the father's house now to be found? No one will understand the answer to that question until after the resurrection of Jesus. But then it will be abundantly clear. The temple he had spoken of was his body. Verse 21. <clears throat> Out of the totally consumed, totally crucified, totally raised body of Jesus comes forth the new community of faith, the bride of Christ, the church. It would take the fact of the resurrection before Jesus' closest friends could realise what Jesus was talking about here. In other words, John the Gospel writer is at least partly writing this account, his Gospel, to affirm and disinspire believers, followers of Jesus, who are living post-resurrection. The resurrection is a sign and proof of the authority that was being demanded by the Jewish leaders in the temple of Jesus. Yes, Jesus is the real temple, the real house of his father. From his consumed, raised body comes the community of faith, the bride that trusts in his word and lives with him. If the historic, physical temple symbolised to faithful Jews the location and presence of God, Jesus is here announcing that as alternative, real temple, the presence of God is actually to be found in him. Remember the prologue to this gospel from chapter one of John? No one has ever seen God, but God, the only son who is at the father's side, has made him known. Chapter 1 verse 18. Here, if you like, is the crux of Christianity. If you really want to know God, get to know Jesus. Enjoy being part of his bride, his family, his temple that we have learned to call church. Let me give you a moment for reflection. Where do you find the presence of God? Are you part of the bride of Christ? Are you seeking to live in him? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Thank you so much, Bill, for your sermon. And now in response to the sermon,
and leading us into prayers, our next hymn can be found on the YouTube page. Thank you, Lord, that we can freely come to you in prayer and that you are our rock through all the instability we may be experiencing at this time. Thank you that we are part of your family, the church, and can help each other as we bring our prayers to you. We pray for those who are not well in mind, body or spirit, and we'll have a time of quiet to lift those we know to your healing hands. We also remember all who are saying goodbye to loved ones at this time. We recognise all the teaching we receive through your word and your anointed ones who help us on our journey through this mm -hmm. life. Thank you, Jesus, that your disciples, through your Holy Spirit, could and can remember that you would die to life on earth, and after three days would rise up again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the daily life in schools and colleges starting up again very soon. We thank you for all that has been taking place in our homes for the continuance of study and learning. We pray for a smooth transition back to the classroom and that children and students can enjoy their study time with their peers. Lord, may their lives not be interrupted again by the coronavirus. We thank you for the unity throughout our land with the rollout of the vaccination to combat the COVID-19 virus. We pray for all those who have been called, called out to you when life was in despair during this last year. May we recognise that you always want to be alongside us throughout our daily life. Lord, we thank you that you have shown in your word in the Bible that by sharing what we have, everyone will benefit. We pray that this can reverberate from us as individuals to the local, national and international authorities. We thank you for our government's rollout of plans for our country and pray that each event can happen for the enjoyment of a socially fulfilling life and all the benefits that come alongside these plans. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, that you will soften the hearts of the different countries who receive those who have fled persecution in their homelands. We pray for the most vulnerable including survivors of torture and human trafficking, and those with disabilities and chronic illnesses. We pray for leaders who are working on bringing their countries out of lockdown so their people can live life to the full again. Along with the COVID-19 virus, we lift in prayer to you, Lord, countries in the midst of war, terrorist activity, natural disasters, climate change, a struggling economy and political instability. We pray for our royal family and especially for our Queen Elizabeth, who has not had Prince Philip by her side for over two weeks now. Thank you that in our lockdowns, they will have spent more precious time together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer that we can all experience the joy of approaching spring with the longer days, the warmth of the sun, birds singing and nature springing to life after a winter's rest. Thank you, Father, that the highest heavens, and the earth and everything around belongs to you, our Lord, our God. Firstly, you love us and want us to love you. You relish in the different ways that each of us show you that we love you. Thank you that you protect and rescue us as we call out to you when in trouble. Thank you we can rest in your refuge and place of safety. Thank you for your grace and salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen.
as we come to the peace. Let us take a moment to think of those in the church family with whom we would normally be sharing the peace in person. Let's bring them to mind during this Lent time. And let us also remember our loved ones and our community in this peace that we share in Christ, though we're temporarily separated by our current circumstances. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you. If you are watching this with someone else, you might like to pause for a moment and take the opportunity to share the peace with them, or else let's move on into the communion which is introduced by the next song on the YouTube page. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation, in your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ our Lord. With your whole church throughout this town, this country and the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. 
Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, we are not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and we shall be healed. And so on behalf of our community, the Church of St. Michael's and myself, the body of Christ, keep us in eternal life. Amen. The blood of Christ keep us in eternal life. Amen. Merciful Lord, grant your people grace to withstand the temptations of the world, the flesh and the devil and with pure hearts and minds to follow you, the only God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life, we who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights, give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ, give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love and pray for, this Lenten tide and always. Amen. Let us go in joy and in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please, would you watch to the end of the video and then find the final song on the YouTube page. <laughs>